Uh, I'm so excited and inspired by this program. I can't wait for you to see and hear uh, what's happening uh, with artistry and Lost Hills, a combination of business, art, uh, passion, commitment, community. Uh, this is called The Art of Hope, Transforming Lives Through Creative Collaboration. And I have on stage uh, five people that together have made something that none of them could have made individually. It takes a team. Uh, in the center is Linda Resnick, who is the vice chair and co-owner of, with her husband Stuart, of the wonderful company. Uh, to her right are uh, Simon and Nikki Haas, the Haas brothers, two of the most creative uh, artists uh, in our country. Uh, and to Linda's left is Anna Patricia Lamelli and Dolce Sanchez, who live in Lost Hills, who are community leaders and who are partners in this whole project that I think is going to rock your world. So with that, let's go to the video. The Central Valley is home to 4,000 of our employees and their families. So it's a community that means a lot to us. Half the people in this town work at the wonderful company. We started our philanthropic work here years ago because we wanted to improve the daily lives of everyone living in the community. My husband and I considered it our moral obligation to do something. Over a 10 year period, we've added all these important things to the town of Lost Hills. Still, there was something missing. I was trying to go to school to become a teacher, but I was struggling financially. But I had no money to commute. I had no money to buy my supplies. There was a point where I thought about giving up. Yo trabajaba, y cuando se nos terminaba el trabajo, buscábamos otro lugar para irnos. Es de 5 a 5, todo el día, per, perder comunicación con los hijos y desobligación en la casa. I was an absent parent. I was always gone, working, trying to provide for my kids. I knew if I could find a way to truly empower the women living in Lost Hills, to give them something that would make them contributors to the household income, give them a sense of pride in their great talent and a sense of community with the other women that we could really create magic here. I've known Nikki and Simon for years and own some of their extraordinary imaginative pieces. Uh, we're the Haas brothers. I'm Simon. I'm Nikki. I'd say that uh, I'm the sculptor and the humorist in the relationship and Simon would be the inventor and the uh, obsessive philosopher in the relationship. Well, Simon and I will do drawings together and we'll come up with a plant that we want to make. Simon will break that plant down into sections that would be like sort of, this is a leaf, this is a branch. And then he'll go, what program can I create that can build that shape? Simon couldn't find anyone to do the intricate beading that he wanted in this project. And I said, I have girls for you. Linda suggested doing it in Lost Hills. There were a lot of women who needed the work there, and they're all good with their hands. So take the end that you don't want to have visible and just put it through a couple of beads so that it disappears. Teaching this beading method is difficult because it is not a, a sort of standard flat beadwork. It's a three-dimensional form uh, that is based on abstract logic. We're creating these three tall palm trees that go into the show we're doing at the Bass Museum. We decided to make plants because they're made of leaves and little berries and all sorts of small parts that can be done from home. Gracias, pues, a los hermanos Haas. Si ese trabajo no hubiera existido, no sé dónde estaría ahorita. 
Um, le di una sorpresa a mi esposo, pagué el carro. It's brought me this sense of belonging in society, not being a burden to it. The work has allowed them to stay home and they can still produce the beautiful beadwork. And that's the magic, really. Mi parte favorita de pertenecer a las hermanas Haas es convivir con las demás mujeres y que todas nos, nos ayudemos entre sí en el trabajo. We're there for one another. We love each other. <laughs> so our next project with the Haas sisters is going to be Micro Freaks. They're like collectible sculptures, basically. So we keep these 20 women employed year after year. And ultimately what that means is that the whole practice is going to be more sustainable. To Linda's credit, her stakes were very high. She took a big leap of faith on us. She had invested so much into Lost Hills, and I think she understands that you can't bring in hope and then take it away or make promises that you don't keep. <laughs> when you work hard at work, that's nice. People buy your product. You hope you're adding something to mankind. But when you do this kind of work, it's the most rewarding work of my life. It's hopefully my legacy. I think that many of the Haas sisters lived in a virtual cocoon. And this process is bringing out those butterflies. I see them becoming perhaps someday the leaders of this community because of the empowerment that it's given them. Sitting in my seat, you can feel the emotion across the stage right now. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'd like to start with some questions. I'll, I'll ask questions across the panel and then open it up to all of you in about maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, let's start with Linda. So there's a lot of different ways to get into this particular aspect of your leadership. Um, but let me ask you, how did you meet the Haas brothers? Of course, I met them in Aspen, right? <laughs> where, where do you meet anybody? And um, uh, we met through Jeannie Rohatton, I think, who's an art dealer. And it was love at first sight, for me anyway. Me too. <laughs> and uh, we started seeing each other in LA, and uh, I wanted them to do a set of benches, some of those crazy looking furry benches with the legs for our entry hall, so we commissioned a piece. and. Um, one thing led to another, and we got to know the families, and it's yep. just been a happy relationship. Now, I know how committed you are to the communities uh, in Lost Hills and throughout uh, the Central Valley. I've been there with, with Linda to see her schools and be in the community. Um, and in fact, I had the privilege of meeting some of the Haas sisters one day when I was there. Um, but there's a spark of, of genius needed to pair up these extraordinary artists and to realize there's this extraordinary talent and to make that match. Maybe one in 10 million could have even thought of it, but you did. Well, I thought about it, you know, as much as nine years ago and for years, I was going to art schools and trying to convince people to come because I knew the talent in Lost Hills, but what they needed was a creative direction to make things that people would want to buy. And one day, well, you can tell me, it, it was Simon, I think, that. You were bemoaning the fact? Uh, yeah, I was. I, I mean, I had been working on a system for beadwork that's based in logic that's kind of difficult and requires a lot of time. Uh, and it's not something that most bead artists really care to do. Um, and I was talking to Linda all about it and saying I, I was having such a hard time getting it executed. Um, and I think that's when the spark happened. Um, and she started telling me about Lost Hills. Um, that was years ago. And, um, you know, we've just followed that path yeah. and wound up with here, and I couldn't have imagined that it would be so amazing. It, it's like that book, you know, Malcolm Gladwell has a book, Blink, about how in the spark of a moment, sometimes there's extraordinary inspiration. It, in fact, reflects years of ruminating on the possibilities, and you, you saw that at that moment. Were you worried, Linda, that it, the, the match wouldn't be right from the... Well, of course, because the beading is intricate. Yeah. 
But it's also in a language like a computer, so anyone could do it. It yeah. isn't in English or Spanish or whatever. Um, and I knew that the women were, were so capable, but I was worried about the learning curve. Yeah. But I must say, the, the fact that Nikki and Simon are there, that they've taught this, that they are, they're there every week, someone comes every week to make sure that things are going right, and they, they really had the patience to make it work. Yeah. They had the commitment and the love. Yeah. That's yeah. why it worked. Yeah, you, you certainly you feel that. Um, let me ask a question before I turn to, uh, to Anna and, and Dolce. Um, can I ask you um, to just describe what's here to my right yeah. um, and what it takes to make it? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the animals are uh, works that we made in Cape Town with a, a project we did um, with a group of women beaters there. Um, and they're several years old, and it's sort of what got us involved in this type of work in the, in the first place. But the plants behind them are completely made top to bottom by the Haas sisters, um, and the amount of work that goes into it is, is really incredible. So a good I, way of explaining it is that when you have um, a, a form like this, it's, it's sort of expressed. It's actually just made with rags and wire. Yeah. Um, when we were first getting them back, they were being made in these like small uh, houses where they're like burning kerosene lamps and they smelled like kerosene. Yeah. But they're just making flat beadwork that sort of stitches together over a form. Like upholstery. What yeah. Simon's created is uh, like as you're beading, you're creating the form. So you're like putting units together to make a shape. So it's, yeah. a pr it's truly a program rather than just an application. So it's um, in terms of its construction, it's becoming much more advanced with the plants. Mm -hmm. And you have this yeah. ability to make much more realistic things. Like the palm trees we made, you would see the shadow and you'd go, that's a palm tree, yeah. you know? It was pretty spectacular, yeah. yeah. And that, you know, the, the, the crossroads we came to was that I wanted to see that palm tree happen, but there's no way one person could actually make that ever. Um, yeah. It has to be a lot of people working on something at that scale. And I'd had in my mind, you know, I've written down all these programs, you know, if, if you string through a blue bead, then put on a red bead, something like that. It's written like a computer. I, I had the palm trees yeah. in my head. I never thought I would actually see them. So it sort of completed. Uh, it was really the missing piece for us. Yeah, I hope the audience will come up and compare the two works right up close, because you'll be able to see the, the, the really advanced, advanced totally. technique, the, the, the second one. It's a cool mix yeah. of like, archaic technology with this like brand new, completely unusual way of, of using craft. And, and it couldn't have happened without, without these two, really, because yeah. it's like Lost Hills. Um, the, everyone there stopped it up. And then Anna and Dulce are, are, are like becoming team leaders, leading the group, teaching everyone else. So there's sort of like a social structure and like an, an ability uh, that is uh, different in Lost Hills than it is in Cape Town. Cape Town is a little bit it would be more difficult to create that structure. Here it's more like a basketball team that's gonna like win the, yeah. the, you know, the finals. And it's like they're ready, they're like <laughs> dedicated and they're gonna do everything it takes to like assist each other in the creating yeah. of the right thing. And, and it needs that in order to conquer Simon's behemoth of a system. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it's, it's pretty unusual. I, I, think, I think I get it. I, it's, yeah. it, it, really, it really is significant advance. I'm gonna yeah. come in a second, one more question. But, but I, but you're not just, it's not just the beating, it's advanced beating. It's not just the advanced beating, but it's the team to create totally. the, the product together. Mm -hmm. And so you need leaders of the team and you need expert beaters. Exactly. Two, two different skills. It's yeah. a lot, yeah. So that's, when Linda says this to you, hey, I know where you might go. I know some people that would be superb. Did you go back to the studio and say, how are we going to say no to Linda? Well, I was el <laughs> no, I, I would never say no anyway, but I was just, I was elated because I yeah. I know that you know it it is something I was I was almost crying to her actually when I said I can't get this I'd been working on it for five years yeah. I can't get this made yeah. and um, I know she wouldn't offer something lightly and uh, I also know how passionate she is about Lost Hills and to me it, it seemed immediately like a dream come true I knew it would be good I just didn't know it would be this good. It's incredible. Um, OK, let me start with Anna. Um, could you give the audience just a little bit of a sense of what it uh, was like growing up in Lost Hills? Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lomeli. And yes, let me set the scenario for you guys. Lost Hills was pretty much a desert area. Not really much around, very like 
weeds, very dry weeds, and many tumbleweeds. We grew up freely, barefoot, running around all over town. I mean, we just had a couple of like alleys. Those were our streets. And um, I remember just being really free, our parents not really being involved in school because they had a compromise to work and provide. So we were pretty much on our own throughout the day. And the oldest one would care for the smaller ones. So I was the boss. <laughs> I was the boss at home because I was the oldest of six. We are a total of six, and I ran the home while my parents were gone working. But we were outside most of the time just creating inventions, what we would do next. There wasn't really many activities to get involved into. So we were just maybe looking around, what can we do, what can we build? I built a tree house with some plywood that my dad had for some other work for home. But that got us entertained there. So it was basically pretty much the same routine day to day. If we were out of school, then you just stuck home finding anything just to get you entertained. What about the story, like the, like the mud on your shoes and the sidewalks? Remember how, like, how someone would know you were from Yes. Still? So then when I got to high school, as I grew older, I started realizing that our community was lacking so many things. And we were pretty much forgotten out there. Nobody really cared. And I felt lonely. When I got to high school, <laughs> I laugh about this now, but it really kind of got to me. They would say, what do you, where do you come from? I'd be like, oh, Lost Hills. We can tell. Lost Hills people, they usually have mud on their feet. Most of the time, their shoes are dirty because we had no streets and there was only dirt. So then that's the way that they would identify us, just by like looking at our shoes and also asking us, what do you do out there? People knew that they, there wasn't much out there. We only had one store, so then they would ask us, what do you do for fun? Just nothing, just hang around. And then, do you chase tumbleweeds? Because <laughs> we had many of those, you know? And I was like, no, I chase rabbits. <laughs> I'm much faster than a tumbleweed, <laughs> you know? So, so a lot has changed, Dulce. A lot has changed over the years. Um, the communities work together. Um, to, Definitely. Yeah. There has been a lot of change, and it's been wonderful change. I know um, when change started happening, a lot of people were skeptical about it because change, it's, something's going to change, and a lot of people are not comfortable with change. But as time went on, um, everybody realized the positive change that we have had now in Lost Hills, and I am so happy thanks to um, Miss Linda and her husband who have been there since day one. They're the ones who nurtured us and kind of helped us grow into this wonderful community that we are now. We're very united. Um, a lot of opportunities have opened up for us. Um, as Anna was saying, when we were in high school, I remember there was a joke that would go around and they would tell us, Oh, do you guys want to, oh, because let me say this something. High school, we did not have a high school. We had to commute 30 minutes um, to a close town called Wasco. So the students from Wasco, they would always make fun of us and they would be like, oh, you know what? If, do you want to know if a person is from Lost Hills? And then they're like, yeah. They're like, oh, well, just look at their shoes. 
if they, had mud, if they have mud on their shoes, they're from Lost Hills. And they would try to like make fun of us, but I, I didn't feel bad. I was like, you know what, I am from Lost Hills. And so uh, we're getting better. We're going to be a big city one day. All of this is just gonna be like, you know, like old memories and it has been. Um, we now have a lot of um, projects going around there. Miss Linda helped build another school, which is bringing a better um, education to the kids in there. We are on the road to actually have a Lost Hills High School, so that's pretty exciting. There's been a lot of programs for the kids. Everything has just been wonderful. We have sidewalks to walk on. We now have a very pretty park because before it was nothing but trees and then just dried up grass. And that was pretty much it. But now we have a water park, we have a track, we have a soccer field where if you would go on any typical day out of the week, the park is filled with families, kids running around. It's just so much joy. And before that, the park wasn't a place where anybody would really want to be. So, because it's, so it's exciting to hear about, about progress. And progress comes a step at a time, but then it's two steps, and then it's three steps. It builds, it gets momentum. So now there's this project, and you've seen some good things happening. There's some trust built with Linda, with a wonderful company, and Linda shows up and says to you, do you want to work on a project? There has been definitely trust. We trust her. Um, many of us just view her as our angel because she came into this old um, town a forgotten town and then she just created something so beautiful out of something that was forgotten. And then this project, this project brought us a lot of opportunities for me specifically. Um, I was going to school, but when this project came around, I was jobless. So I actually thought about quitting school because I wasn't going to afford it. I come from immigrant fam uh, an immigrant family who work from sunup to sundown in the fields, and it's still very hard to have that little extra income to help your daughter get to school. So it was pretty hard for me, but this job opened up so many possibilities. It gave me the opportunity to continue with my education, most importantly. Um, it gave me a flexible schedule where I could work at school, um, during little breaks, at home, and I was getting that income that I needed in order for me to be, to be able to continue with my education. It's exciting to be able to say that Dulce earned her four-year degree from Cal State Bakersfield this year. Thank you so much. Uh, while on breaks, occasionally being able to do the beating work at school so she could use her time well. Um, Anna, tell me about learning it the early part of all this, uh, it must have been hard. It was. When it was first presented to us, I was just startled. And I just looked at the tiny beads. And I was like, <laughs> my goodness. I just thought to myself, this is going to be some hard work. But I was very determined. And I really had my hopes in this project. I was very skeptical when I was first introduced to it by my son's school. I, had, I was jobless, going on unemployment, and I wasn't really proud of that. I, want, I don't want to be a burden to society. I want to be a productive human being. And I attended my kids' school. I became a volunteer there while I look for a job day to day. And that's where I was told about this opportunity, about an art program, and that I would get paid. And I was like, wow, well, I really hope it pays good enough because I need a job. And, but I was still skeptical. But I decided to give myself an opportunity to try it out. I mean, I had all this time left over. So then I was like, I'm going to try this. And when I saw the work, I was very confused. <laughs> Didn't know where <laughs> was the beginning or where was the end to it. And I was just like, I'm going to do this. Because this 
work will allow me to engage more with my kids and be more of a present parent to my kids and not let the same story repeat itself with my children. My children will have better opportunities and they'll become better human beings to society because of this project. Uh, thank you, so what, thank you. Yeah. So, so what's it like to work with these two uh, unusually creative, driven, genius-like people? Are they, are they uh, is it fun? Um, I think the perfect word to describe it would be fun. Yeah. It's so fun, it's so amazing. We have had the opportunity to get to know them personally and they're just so caring, um, they're so supportive. I actually had told them a story about a former boss that I had that was really mean and I was just like, no, you know what, I can't do this anymore, so I quit that job. And um, it's so funny because growing up, I would always talk to my mom and I would tell her, I hate my jobs, I hate my jobs. And she would cheer me on and she would be like, you know, it's okay, it's going to be better. And um, when I started school, well, I started working at 16. Um, but all throughout school, I always had a job that I did not enjoy. Um, and I would constantly think to myself, it's okay, you have to get through it because at the end, your pot at the end of the rainbow is going to be being able to teach because that's what I went to school for. You're, go you're going to be able to have your dream job. And now with them, I'm like, I don't know, like I feel like I'm living my dream job now. <laughs> I have two dream jobs. It's just so wonderful. Um, they're amazing. They're so funny. Um, and they're so kind. <laughs> I'd like to add something to that. And when I first was introduced to the brothers and Linda, I had, um, I had the opportunity to work in a company, but never met her. And to me, this was like, wow. This was great. Um, I met them and I was, well, when I met them, I was like, it's really hard to even get that across my mind because I thought artists were these people way above us, really like stars. You can't really touch them. And I thought of Linda that way. I admired her because she's a great woman that has accomplished so many things and I just admire her because She's a woman, and I just, she empowers us all women, and she inspires me so much to be a better person. And I was just amazed how these stars are touchable. Yeah. And I can hug them, and I can touch them, and I can thank them so much for transforming our lives. So Anna, yeah. you're, you're the, the lead yeah. artisan. Um, so what do you see in these works that you made? What do I see? What do you see? How do, you know, I look at them and I see something I've never seen before. But you made it. You, you were working on it when it was just a single bead. So at the beginning, it looked like nothing. <laughs> 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 just beads in a jar. Millions and, and millions of them. Millions and millions of them. And I thought to myself, oh Lord it has to become a final product. <laughs> and I really have to invest a lot of time into it. Uh, to you guys, I don't know what it looks like, but to me, it's more personal. It has my, all my effort for my children, for my family, for my community, for those women that would think I would never be able to do this. I would push myself to do it. I had no option. I was determined I was gonna learn it. And I, it's hard work put into it. Lots of heart. Just so many emotions into it, made with so much love and dedication. It's just much more than an art piece. Much more. It's my income, a piece that has freed me from just that job that I hated so much. 
Get the wonderful company. No. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me ask. <laughs> Thank you. Such such uh, such thought. Um, let me ask Nikki and Simon now, as you you know this, but you just heard Anna Dolce. So, what do you see in your creation? I see that too. I'm um, when these start, they start as very abstract drawings, and um, honestly, they're a little bit cold uh, as a as a design um, when you see them on paper. And now I just know, I know how they're made, I know how much time it takes and how they're assembled. And I also know that each piece was made by one of these women who have become our friends and I, I treat each leaf, as we're assembling them, I treat each leaf so much more carefully now than I ever treat anything that I make myself. Um, I'll sometimes make something and just like toss it on the table and these I, I really baby them because I know that they are, um, it's really like a piece of somebody. Yeah. Um, and so I see the community uh, kind of wrapped up in one object. And as artists, we, we're in this to, to have experiences, to, be, to have fun and to put love into our work. And um, if it's just the two of us, we're able to do that. But never to this level where when I see it, I, I actually like experience yeah. a, an emotion that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Awesome. I, I see like, you know, if, like on a fine grain analysis level of, the, of what it is that we're trying to talk about, like the, sh the story about the mud on the shoes, like you guys are outsiders even inside of your own community. And you take like a coarse grain analysis, just even say in America, you're women, you're people of color. There's so many things stacked against them that it's just a big looming problem in the world that like can't really it's hard to wrap your head around how to take care of it, right? And I think that what I see in a product like that or a sculpture like this is just one example of how you can sort of like thread the needle of fixing that problem, even if it is just with a group of 21 people. And then the power of that is that you create a, a voice that speaks against that problem, right? As a community and not just as like an individual or even like as a brand or whatever it would be or reputation. And that's what makes it art, is the fact that like, all of us work together to come up with this idea. And now a community of us are working together to execute it. And then we're creating a voice that's much bigger than any of us as individuals to speak against something we really think and care about, which is like everybody on Earth deserves a voice, deserves ability to be who they are and live freely and love themselves. And I think like, that's. Like, it's, it sounds so grand to even say that, but that's what this aloe is. It's, mm. it's, it's, giving, it's giving, you know, specifically all of us a voice, but then also everybody a voice if they're able to, like, hear the story and think about it and spread it. So Thank that's you. an art piece. Thank you. Yeah, wow. Totally. Wow. Let's open it up. Oh, I wanted to show oh. the mi if I may, the oh. micro freaks. Oh, yes. Yeah, because mm. this is, can we put this slide up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> These little creatures are out in the lobby uh, right behind that, that wall. And this is our first collectible um, uh, series that we're doing with the Ladies of Lost Hills. Uh, it's very expensive to buy the Haas Brothers uh, products, you know, their, their artwork. The palm tree sold for $100,000, for instance, where they did the little dates. But this is an entry level uh, product that people that want to start collecting the Haas Brothers and the Haas Sisters can, can buy. So they'll be uh, available for purchase very soon. Yeah. I just want to get that little advertisement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and I know about collectibles because we used to own the Franklin Mint. So. <laughs> totally. So uh, questions all the way in the back. Can you hear me? OK. We've been talking about rural America. We're going to have another session right after this um, about rural broadband. We had a wonderful session this morning with entrepreneurs, Matt a Distiller in northern Michigan who has rehabbed an entire community around building a distillery, um, <clears throat> employing people that never thought they would have a job. And I'm, my, my question is, I think this is so moving and special and your investment with the Resnicks and then the Haas brothers to, to engage with these women. Is this scalable? Do you see ways that artists could go into communities, whether it's probably not beadwork, but something else, and train people 
as you have Anna and Dulce and others to, to build community because I think that's what really is going to mean so much and there's so much, I mean, this whole message here is really important. I'm just wondering if this is a scalable idea. Um, I, I'll take that. I, I think it's very scalable because there is so much talent in rural America. People go to Haiti to get their work done. They go to Bangladesh. They go to all these countries where if they investigated America, they would find uh, in the Ozarks, for instance, the, the sewing work of the women and all over uh, really great talent because it's a cottage industry. They do fabulous knitting. They do fabulous embroidery. And I'm hoping that if this becomes more public, that people will get an inspiration to really tap into the creativity in rural America. Uh, Simon or Nikki, what would you say to someone, an artist, who is very interested but skeptical to help them overcome the block, to take the risk to start this kind of relationship? Something like this? I mean, it's definitely more, um, there is more effort involved in um, setting something up like this as opposed to just outsourcing something to a, a vendor that you might use otherwise. But the reward is so much bigger. And working with somebody like Linda who really cares and, and has really helped in terms of infrastructure, getting to use the community center and things like that, um, the, the amount of love and lessons that come to us during this uh, makes the art so much more beautiful. And um, it's worth it in every sense. Another question? Uh, this, is, this happens to be my wife, Karen Hurley. There's <laughs> in the audience, obviously. <laughs> yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, for Anna and Dolce, um, Dulce, um, could you explain, I know you do some of your beading at home, but I also understand that you come together um, as a group to bead. And can you describe what that is like as a um, a community of women. Yes. We have a center in our community park where we gather certain days out of the week. Um, it's like three, day, three days out of the week where we all women that are in the project gather. We'll go over any issues that any of them should be facing in the beating work. We help out each other with the technique or anything that's gotten them stuck. But we also are this family that just bonds and we worry about each other while we're there. We'll be working and talking at the same time about how's life going, what's going on in your household. And if any of them should be feeling sad. She has this great group of supporters to lift her up. No woman there is alone by herself. We are a community within our community. And you guys were relative strangers before the project, right? Some of you? Not necessarily. Um, well, some of us. Me specifically, I'm the youngest one of the group. Um, I'm, I don't have kids, I'm not married. So I, I didn't really socialize with them. I knew Anna from um, my childhood because her mom lives right in front of me. But for the rest of the ladies, I would see them around the community, but I never approached them. I would never say hi to them. I would smile, but that's about it. And now with this, um, with this project that has been going on, they get to be my friends and I get to learn so much from them. Um, and like Anna said, we're just like this group who love each other. We're always there to support one another. I have learned so much from them and um, they're always so excited to get together. In fact, almost every Friday we get together and then we have this potluck and um, especially when the brothers are there, Miss Linda, everybody's so excited and it's just a support group a support group of women who are empowering each other and who are there for one another whenever times get rough. We didn't have friends in Lost Hills either. You know I mean? <laughs> and now it's like we have this whole group. We oh. loved and respected Linda. We knew that part of that, but it was great to meet all of you. I look forward to coming so much because yeah. you guys fun. make yeah. so much food. It's <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so good. <laughs> and indeed, the, the project serves as a therapy 
a therapy to many women that were for a very long time stuck just at home with their household duties. And it's allowed them to just really come out of themselves and just be just these bright women. Lovely, thank you. Uh, next question. So much for this beautiful panel. It's I've heard so much about this work from you, Linda, and I haven't had a chance to meet you all. I'm Peggy Clark from the Aspen Institute, and I just wonder. Um, forgive me, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to ask, but where you both are from? You, maybe you were born in the U.S. Maybe you were born elsewhere. But to the Haas brothers, there may be other artisanal techniques that uh, the Haas sisters have from their homeland. And we have a small project at the Aspen Institute that works with artisans all over the world and tries to find ways to uh, recover and reinvent traditional techniques like what you've done here with designers like the Haas brothers. So can, could I ask you where, um, where you're from and are there other artisan techniques in your, in your family traditions? Um, for me, I was born in Mexico. I'm actually a DACA recipient right now. And um, I am from this, this small little town called El Tule, and it's close to Guanajuato. My mom is actually part of the Haas sisters as well, so it's so fun I get to work with her. And um, when she came in, she did a lot of like knitting and um, a lot of things that she does with her hands. She, she, um, she creates these wonderful, um, I don't know what they're called, but they're little designs on pillows. So she does that and then she, she does the knitting. Um, so for her, since she had a little bit experience of doing hands-on, it was really easy for her to pick up the, the strategies. And um, for me, I didn't have like a lot of practice, but I had determination mm. and that helped me. Uh, next question was right here. Hello, um, I'm Robert Bank. Uh, thank you so much. This is so incredibly inspiring. I guess what I wanted to ask is, I'm sure there's more demand to be one of the Haas sisters than there are jobs, or is that not the case? And how do people get recruited or become eligible, and how does that all work? Um, I think there is more demand, that's true. Uh, we. We only have so much work that we can make and um, that we're capable of managing. That's part of the hope uh, is for more artists to come in. And I think Linda has a dream of, of Lost Hills becoming an arts colony. Yes, that's my hope mm -hmm. that uh, someday we can attract. Now we did attract a, a high-end knitter, but they dropped the stuff off and they didn't explain it to anybody and they left and it didn't work. So, um, but in all fairness, didn't you think the project was going to take six months, the first flower project? Yes. And how long did it take? Um, it was so fast. It was like six <laughs> weeks. It was so fast. So don't think and that they're slugging along no. here. They really got into it. And once yeah. they learned the technique, right? They're, they're, it's incredible how quickly you guys work. I mean, seriously. And I, as far as the recruiting, I think that, that um, the wonderful company really helped with that part, putting out uh, flyers, and we had a couple of sessions just introducing the project. And um, the team we have now is the first team that uh, showed up, and we we all just really love each other so much, and really uh, at this point can get ideas across to each other super easily. We know uh, we just know each other, and um, I want to maintain that feeling. I don't really think that we personally are going to try to just expand into a, a huge thing. This is a, it's a, a really special group. Um, and the art we make is very much informed by them and, and vice versa. So it's, a, it's something we want to hold on to. Yeah, and we're trying to make it sustainable. That's more what we're focused on rather than expanding. And it's like with the, with the artwork we make, it's like we don't, make, we don't want to make tons and tons and tons of artwork. It's just not good for us. It, we want everything to feel special. Um, but that's where so those collectible pieces come in. That's what's totally. so good about them. And this was Linda's idea, and, and we were really excited about it because it is hard to, um, you know, Nikki and I have ideas for artworks that we want to make, but we can't just keep 
creating 100 pieces you know, all the time. And this was a way for us to, to keep work consistent and make things that we're super proud of that is a perfect combination of Linda's expertise, our expertise, and their expertise. And um, uh, so that is what I'm really, really excited about. It's, yeah. it's pretty incredible to see 21 people working full time with the flexibility to work from home, from school, wherever they need to be mm -hmm. uh, while making art and making a living too. Yeah, in South Africa, we've kept it rolling for seven years. I think our goal is 10. We'll probably exceed that. And, and you know, I, I want these to last forever and ever because it's like you can't just insert yourself into a community, create this, like, amazing community and be like, see ya. It's like doesn't work like that. No, it would be devastating. So, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Linda taught us that. I mean, watching what you've done for the community and, like, she's mentored us in this whole idea of, like, what it means to actually think about legacy and the idea of, like, you know, responsible and moral business practice and what it means to engage with somebody and, and to provide a job. It's, it's more profound than just paying somebody for something. You're creating a community, a, a life. You know, it's a lot. So. All, the way, all the way in the back. Thank you so much for coming, all of you. Um, this is particularly to the Haas brothers. Seems like your ideas and your designs came before you met the Haas sisters. And what I'm really interested in is how much has meeting them and this collaboration changed the way that you're working now with them? Has it changed your designs or? It has, uh, and it's changed a lot. So the, these are a good example. Each of these leaves is a very manageable size and the, um, the Flower tops are actually made of these little rings that are just this big, very small pieces. It's really easy to carry such small pieces to school or home, work on them like that. So it's changed, um, it's changed the way we design because we need to make sure everything uh, can be assembled from lots of small pieces. This, the, this little horsey creature thing can't be <laughs> taken home. Um, it's not a good candidate for Lost Hills. Um, so it's actually pushing us into the plant world uh, because plants are always made up of little pieces and that's exciting for me um, as somebody who just obsesses over them. Um, well, I mean, like, I, I have this personal, uh, to me, a profound privilege that I, I, have a, I have a little son with my wife right here and he's amazing and I have this ability to work for myself. I can leave work if I have to and I can decide exactly when and how I work. And being able to like spend time as a father, that's my most important job in my life. But it's still important to be doing this, this other thing too. You need to be professional and make money and, and express yourself and feel like you're part of something else. And, and so I think like that was one of the biggest markers on Simon's, uh, like his momentum towards what it was he was trying to design is, is that you could go to school, you could have a kid and take care of them. You could be at home and also like have your own life and still, you know, fill your time exactly when and how you need to fill it um, with pieces that you could do wherever you are. Um, and it's and that's been the, the the biggest the biggest part of like working with with these guys from Lost Hills. Um, but also their ability is so much more than we ever expected. So that's changed the design just in like Simon is having trouble keeping up even, just That's in creating true. like new types of work for them uh -huh. to sort of like sop up and learn and like keep Which is rare for me. Yeah, totally. so, and, and that's part of why we created these little micro freaks. And sorry to keep plugging it, but the Haas Brothers dot shop, wait, oh my God. wait list, get on there because they're gonna- What's the website? The Haas Brothers dot shop. And it's like- The Haas you can Brothers dot shop. Sign up for a mailing list. We're not gonna email you a ton of bullshit, I promise. It's just gonna be, it's just gonna be for this project because it's, uh, we're we're like that's that's part of it this can be happen from home you can you can like have something that for us is uh, a really unusual project and it's and it's something that we've created with with everybody on stage and, and Linda's led us into creating something that that we've never had the ability even to, to create before my mind is flexed in so many ways just creatively like working with with Linda and her team it's it's been uh, a major challenge is to keep up, but that's that's the kind of project where you're so proud when you when you finish it, mm -hmm. and it, and ultimately it's pushing into the most beautiful thing that we can be a part of. So, so we have to close the program in a moment, but I'd like to ask Linda a question and Anna to close it. And Linda, the question is: in the video, you say that you could see um, the the Haas sisters becoming the leaders of the community, and. I'd just like to ask you to reflect upon that as a part of your vision. 
Well, Lost Hills is an unincorporated town. So if you look at a map of California, where Lost Hills is, is blank. There, was, there were no street lights, no sidewalks, completely unincorporated, no leadership except for a water. Um, water district. The water district. Um, no police, sheriff comes from 20 miles away. So we've been there for 10 years now, starting very slowly with a basketball court to today what we have. And what we're trying to do is teach empowerment to the people of Lost Hills so that they can be the leaders of their own town. We got taxes. They were never got any money from the government, even though Lost Hills paid $17 million in taxes to the state because of the oil and, frankly, because of the wonderful company that, that's nearby. And so we've gotten a part of that back. And the community leaders now have that money to invest in the community any way they see. So they're starting to work financially uh, with, with their dreams coming true. So that, you know, we want to, we never want to walk away because half of the households in Lost Hills have someone that works at the wonderful company, but we want them to be self-sustaining. Sustainability is important in everything we do, and it's as important in Lost Hills as it is to the you know, the sustainability of the electrical system. We're getting off the grid by 2024. We've made a commitment to that in our company. And sustainability yeah. is really the heart of wonderful. Yeah. Anna, the last word. Um, what would you like this audience to remember from what they had the privilege of witnessing today in learning about your work? I'd love for this to be remembered because it's made a difference in our community and myself, empowering me, making me feel so much better by myself. It's freed me from these jobs that I didn't enjoy as much. I thank my Heavenly Father every day that I wake up for the job that I have. And for these amazing people whose I know my Lord has touched and inserted a beautiful heart in them and inspired them to be so giving. I like this phrase about this one song, and it says, ordinary instruments make extraordinary sounds. I think them and everybody that collaborated with this project in allowing us to sound loud and play our melody loud. Thank you.